Six Conference Australia 2013. And our first speaker um, for this session is going to be Michael Meeks. Um, Michael Meeks says, Michael Meeks is a Christian and enthusiastic believer in free software. Which one are you more enthusiastic about or a believer in? <laughs> <laughs> he very much enjoys working for SUSE, where as a Linux desktop architect, he tries to understand and nudge the direction of our Linux investment. He has appreciated working on various pieces of infrastructure and applications over the years from GNOME Office, uh, through component technologies, to evolution, accessibility, Migo, and most laterally, LibreOffice, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, the title of the presentation, Two Years of LibreOffice. Can everyone please give Michael a very warm welcome. What an introduction. You know, how, how do I follow that? I don't know. Hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Perfect. Excellent. So if I touch this, I notice that uh, you know, changing orientation changes the volume thing. This is what I'm going to say. So uh, there you are. That helps the people on the web find what they're doing. Well, uh, there you go. So one of the things that we've been doing is, is a lot of work. And one of the things we're most interested in is, is changing the philosophy of uh, LibreOffice or, or the, the code base to say that um, changes are welcome. We love people to change the code. You know, send us your patches, and we will work hard to integrate them, um, which I think is something new. And that's, that's shown some uh, really impressive results. So this is a uh, number of active contributors a month. So we, we try and track how many people are contributing. And uh, I guess this is Oracle, sadly left the project. But this blue stuff here are new people contributing to the project that we'd never seen before. So when we launched, suddenly, bang. Loads of people came. So there was something about LibreOffice that makes it just that much more compelling than, than what was OpenOffice. And you know, people are interested in contributing. And they get their code in. Actually, this is code that's actually committed and, and in the product. So that's kind of cool. And we're pleased about that. Obviously, it's always good to grow the graph. Another thing we're pleased about is just the sheer diversity of, of people there. So uh, you know, from, from the government of Munich to, of course, Red Hat and SUSE, great big contributors, uh, Intel, uh, you know, bits from IBM, the Apache project, and, and so on. So lots and lots of different uh, guys contributing. Oh. And that's resulted in, well, lots of new features, lots of uh, functionality. And one of the things we measure is uh, the number of unique IP addresses each week that we get. These are new ones we've never seen. Of course, there's some degree of DSL rollover. Uh, there's lots of. Uh, uh, people who are using NAT, you know, the whole of China is only one IP address, you know. So, uh, so that, that's kind of a shame. Uh, so we just like to add about a billion to our, our, our numbers. But, um, um, and of course, this doesn't cope with uh, Linux uh, downloads, uh, which so, so our, our new IPs address uh, each week are in excess of Fedora plus SUSE, um, with a, a good margin on top of that. Um, we don't know what the Ubuntu is, but we expect that there are a lot of downloads of that as well. So, in terms of the number of people getting LibreOffice. Um, there's really a large number, and these are going up. As you see, the vast majority of those are Windows, uh, a great chunk of Mac, and then some Linux, which we think represents uh, the market. But this, again, doesn't measure the Linux distributions. It's the phone home feature uh, that we use to, to collect that data. So that's encouraging. Um, clearly, we have a huge branding uh, cliff to climb to tell people about our, our cool new uh, project and, and free software and so on. Um, one of the ways we do that is we try and get stuff out quickly. So this is kind of a, a <coughs> boilerplate slide. The punchline is that when you get your Linux distro, you should get something really good in it. So the point two release is what is typically synchronized with the sixth monthly cycle. So one of the things we're trying to do is to get, you know, huh. well, one of the things GNOME was trying to do was to get other people to line up with its release cycle, and uh, with some success. Seemingly, um, you know, I guess uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, um, LibreOffice, and you know, I think the kernel has a three-monthly schedule, so again, the kernel is kind of lined up with this. So hopefully the whole world will move to a place, you know, where, um, yeah, because it's really soul-destroying, isn't it, having the latest and greatest thing that you release a week after, you know, a, the distro ship it, you know, because then it's another six months till anyone's actually using it in anger. So, so, I'm going quickly, but we'll, we'll see. LibreOffice 4, so just, this is just some of the new features, just to give you a bit of a taste for the different kinds of things uh, we've been doing. So one of the things that uh, people keep banging on at us about is interoperability. You know, sending your, your slides to other people, sending your uh, documents, and, and getting what you expect uh, out the other end. Um, and yeah, if you're doing a big deployment, incidentally, if, if anyone's crept in here that isn't a hacker, uh, uh, actually, let's do a quick poll. Who is a hacker? I'm, I'm a hacker. That's cool. 
And, and who is a sort of sysadmin deployer type user of, awesome, okay, you guys cool. I'll give you a brief tip. Um, so lots of people, when they start to think about deploying LibreOffice um, in big enterprises, they make one elementary mistake, which is to think that it costs money. So, so when you are, and now of course service costs money, um, but when you're deploying um, Microsoft Office uh, 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 in a heterogeneous environment, you have Microsoft Office and LibreOffice, and so the thought is, well, leave loads of people in Microsoft Office, leave, you know, move segments to, to LibreOffice, and then they can just interoperate by the interoperability support, right? Seems like a good plan. Unfortunately, this is actually a terrible plan. Um, because there's always going to be problems in Microsoft's ODF support. Um, there is always going to be problems in R, uh, XLSX, or, or whatever support. Um, we are constantly working to improve it, and there are constantly problems. It's like one of those you know, lifelong uh, works. So what well, the best thing to do is to simply deploy LibreOffice everywhere, um, particularly on Windows. Of course, all those Windows machines should be running free software. And uh, then the few people that actually need to stick with, say, Microsoft Excel, they have some weirdo you know, macro riddle power thing that we can't yet cope with, they should have two Office suites on their machine. So the key is to remember that you can install LibreOffice next to Microsoft Office on Windows, and it still works. And then, of course, you use the interoperability filters one way. You load your documents, you convert them to ODF, you exchange across your enterprise in ODF, and suddenly you're, you're substantially freed um, from all of that vendor lock-in, and you don't have any interop problems. Anyhow, what is this? Aha, oh, this is a nice interop feature around uh, comments. So it, lots of people will complain about this. The, in Word, you can stick a comment for a range, and you never could in LibreOffice. It was for a point. And people don't comment about points. They comment about chunks of text. So this is a, you know, you can imagine the round trip problems when you don't have that feature in the core. You know, your comments get mangled, now they don't. And interestingly, paid for by the Open Source Business Alliance, which is kind of nice. So these people got together and aggregated loads of different companies, and in fact, governments in this case, government uh, agencies, and each of them paid a small amount of money. They all met together, agreed which the most important bugs were, and then they funded several companies to actually go and fix those. And so we love that, because that helps build the ecosystem around the project, and uh, you know, it's, it's just fundamentally good for uh, attracting uh, features to the project. So here we go, RTF, well, you know, so this is the 3.6 version over here, which is looking stylish, and uh, the 4.0. So just a thumbnail of, <laughs> and, and actually we construct hundreds of these documents, you know, in some cases, so for example, the latest Microsoft Office 2000 and uh, whatever it is, you know, it produces invalid zip files, you know, so all of their XLSX files actually slightly invalid. And so there was, you know, some hypersensitive check there, and the net result was you couldn't load any of these documents at all. It would just go, mm, like that. So, you know, little fixes like this making a massive, massive impact, and lots of them all over the board. Um, so, you know, depending on what your document has in it, of course, we do better or worse. But, uh, you know, RTF is very substantially improved here. Another thing is formulae, for example. You know, I particularly love the bug with uh, RTF whereby the first formula in the document would simply truncate the rest of the document after that, you know? So if, if you don't want to, you know, it, it got difficult, which probably matches a whole load of people's reading habits as well, you know, so like, you know, kind, of, uh, kind of good. Um, anyhow, so uh, e-ink support, you know, you have one of these horrendous uh, tablets from, from the other side that, you know, you can scribble on your documents. Now we can import that. Again, paid for um, by, by a customer who just wanted this one feature of a small consulting company, Lenido, doing, doing a great job. Um, another thing people do is that they go and they stupidly build their enterprise around, uh, you know, server software that runs on a single platform and is an open source, um, and so that creates nightmares. So one of those is SharePoint, um, and so lots of companies have already, you know, locked themselves in, and of course we're trying to unlock them and uh, encourage them into the free world. So there's a whole load of um, work there to do CMIS, which is a standard protocol for that, and of course that works with Alfresco, Nexo, and all these other. Um, open source content management systems. So hopefully that's cool. Another thing that we really try to do as, as LibreOffice is get people out of proprietary file formats. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of them out there, a lot of legacy ones, and loads of work has been put in uh, in the past WordPerfect, if you remember that. We still get requests for reveal codes feature in, in, uh, in OpenOffice, uh, LibreOffice, which is a shame. Um, work support, Visio, we did last release, uh, had a load, load of Visio work. Mm, yeah, I'm going to slide about that next. A word perfect, but Microsoft Publisher is, is I guess, the, the big new marquee um, attempt at this. Now, there are some features missing in LibreOffice in terms of getting all these frames right, and, you know, but at least we're starting to get your data out. You know, the text is there, you can tweak it, 
and uh, you know you can actually print out uh, something nice. So hopefully we can start to replace that uh, proprietary piece. A whole load of work was done on the Visio support too. That shipped in the last release, but in, in this release we get pretty much everything. Um, in, in terms of file formats, we, we support all of them. Back to version 1.0 in wherever. And we even support the unreleased uh, 2013, although I understand Microsoft started announcing the whole Office 2013 yesterday. Is it today? So, um, yeah, so we're pretty pleased about that. That's, that's kind of good. Yeah. And you can get stencils. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, really, it's not nothing to do with me. Friedrich and uh, Valik Filipov, who's a fantastic Russian volunteer uh, living in Canada, who sits down and reverse engineers these things. He's got a brilliant tool that allows you to ins introspect the structure. And, yeah, just some, some great work there. And those libraries are all reusable. So if you want to uh, you know, write a small C program to dump all the text out of something for an index or whatever, there's the small standalone libraries that do that, and they've done, done just a great job. So calc improvements, yeah, well, so just uh, looking at one component. So one of the things that, um, that the competition have is the ability to turn XML into spreadsheets. So you can look at your XML file, look at your attributes, arrange them as columns and, and sheets and so on, and, and suck them all in. And you can do that dynamically too, so you can continually uh, re-import this stuff. So we have the first cut of that, uh, which does a one-shot import uh, going on. Uh, we hope to see that you know, being done as a live, a live stream that updates. But that's it's kind of quite nice for people. In terms of prettiness, people like all of these, you know, show me the bad person in the class type, you know, stuff. Who, who didn't make their grades? Who should get the, uh, you know, whatever. So we got a whole load of that, again, done entirely by uh, this excellent volunteer, Marcus uh, Mohan, which is, which is cool. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, Attachmate, which is a privately held company, acquired SUSE, so I have no options anymore. But if you do, you know, there are a whole load now of new formulae that can prove <laughs> How amazingly rich or otherwise you'll be uh, you know, in the future, which is quite fun. So there are a load of other fun, you know, sort of hard to categorize. One, one is uh, the one that I'm demonstrating now with the, the beautiful you know, uh, phone remote control, which is kind of fun via Bluetooth. So instead of using the presenter view, which, which is working ever better, presenter console. The, the problem with the presenter console, of course, is when you come to do a demo, you can't see your demo on both screens. So you have to switch clone. But if you've got it on your phone, then you can clone your monitors and Life is easier for speakers, hopefully, and you can also wander around, uh, which helps keep people awake. You know, when the, when the audience is starting to nod, you can do this. Anyhow, this is a Google Summer of Code project by Andre Hunt, and it's it's kind of cool, kind of cool. You can even use speaker notes uh, actively, usefully. One of the things I love one of these GPU geniuses, like where's Keith gone? Ah, hiding at the back. Um, so one thing I really like is a laser pointer. You know, there's an accelerometer in this thing. We should be able to get a laser pointer. But you, you'd need the moir effect, you know, the, the sort of uh, aperture. Uh, so, so I was just wondering, you know, maybe we could... Uh... <laughs> Anyhow, just a bit of protocol support. So that, that's shipping in 4.0. Another fun thing, which seems entirely pointless, and well, might be, is that uh, is is logo uh, integration? A logo being the latest uh, language of choice. Um, so it turns out you can write a logo interpreter in like two lines of Python. So we we did that, um, and uh, then you can draw pretty pictures with it. And and actually, uh, Leslie, uh, what, the reason he did this, and again, a volu volunteer doing this, is that uh, in Hungary there's some a requirement that everyone should learn some kind of programming language, and you know, that's, that's a bit difficult on Windows, you know, it's a bit of a pain. But if you have LibreOffice deployed everywhere, it, you don't really want to teach them Star Basic, honestly. And, and you don't want to teach them, you know, some of these other things. But actually, Lego, where you can see this little turtle and move it around, and you can translate the commands. I know that's not to everyone's taste. But if you're Hungarian, you know, having a Hungarian command for left, you know, is more accessible to children. And, uh, yeah, so it looks pretty pretty. And it's built a nice sort of learn-to-program document that gets really some quite advanced uh, drawings out of it. It looked really, really attractive. So children can write you know, a few hundred lines, well, a few, a few tens of lines, and get something really pretty. So that's cool. Of course, it's no good adding features if underneath it's all just totally disgusting. And there is quite a lot of yuck underneath. Um, so one of the problems is always building LibreOffice. You know, well-meaning people would continually check things in that would then break other things. And this continues to this day. However, if you do that, you start getting spammed with emails that contain an entire build log. So pretty soon, you know, your incoming thing is, is throttled, and all you can do is push the fix, you know. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's, that's good. Um, hopefully this helps. Do the developer? <laughs> do we what? Do the US the developer? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, completely. Yeah, destroy their incoming mail system. So, um, <laughs> so that's good. And, and we, we build now for loads and loads of platforms, you know, Android, 
ARM, Android x86. We had Android MIPS for a while, which just shows you how dedicated we are. Um, you know, all of those uh, Linux distributions, uh, Windows, of course, is a major, major problem because fewer people actually use it, and it takes a long time to, uh, to build. So again, uh, ByteMark have donated some huge machines with massive, of massive CPUs, SSDs, you know, uh, coming out of every muscle and so on. And you know, they can actually build in, in a couple of hours, uh, which is quite good. So uh, we, you know, the, the buildability is much improved. If you check it out, it should build. Another thing we're doing is uh, switching away from our custom patched version of DMake, uh, a, a, a tool even more popular than uh, you know, I don't know, something really unpopular. <laughs> CMake. Yeah, CMake is, yeah, I guess looks like a precursor to DMake, doesn't it? But um, I'm assured it's much better. Anyhow, um, so we're switching to GNU Make, which is great, except it turns, GNU, turns out GNU Make is not as maintained as you might hope. Uh, the last release was in 2010, and we have some critical bug fixes we're trying to get out. So if you know uh, a GNU Make maintainer, uh, you know, sort of encourage them in a vigorous way uh, from me. Um, one of the nice things about switching to GNU Make is that we can now build almost all of LibreOffice's, you know, 10,000 plus files with a single GNU Make instance. So you run one Make, it loads all the dependencies, which takes maybe 20 seconds when you've uh, done it all, you know, which is quite a lot of data. And then we can parallel build almost everything. So if you can imagine a build where you do all of your pre-processing to start with, so you know, all of the, the header building, all of the IDL compilation, all the stuff that you can't um, really parallelize. And then you can build every C file, C++ file in parallel, pretty much. So if you want to test your monster new piece of hardware, uh, you know, LibreOffice can provide some real 1,000, 10,000 wide parallelism. Um, for your money, you know, which is which is kind of cool. Cool. You should have, uh, you know, racer races, racer races. You know, the Gen 2 uh, is faster. Than... Anyhow, lots of these people have uh, have helped do that, which is cool. Another thing we were lumbered with was a total lack of unit tests. So there was actually no way that uh, you could really tell that the Office Suite was going to work, having you know done all of these changes for six months. It's a bit of a problem. So now we have a whole load of unit tests. Marcus Mohar at the top. You may remember did the nice calc features, did loads of work here. And yeah, there's just lots and lots of these. One of the interesting things we did was um, after managing to get LibreOffice to bootstrap a small library and take a chunk of it and actually use it, which was really the, the problem, why no one had written any unit tests was that you, you couldn't bootstrap the complicated component model which was supposed to enable reuse, but in fact really hindered it. Um, so once we fixed that, we could then start adding tests. And so people went a bit wild and added loads. And one of them we did was add all of the CVE documents from the past umpteen years. Uh, we thought we'd check that they are still fixed. About half of them had regressed. So uh, you know the bug had reappeared in some form. So now uh, pretty much every time you do a through, through build, you test all those CVE documents. And some of them are pretty cool. You know, you can launch WordPad with just by loading some of them uh, on Windows. Or you could, you know. Um, the only slight problem with that is that many of these show up on virus checkers as being the nightmares they are. So we have to sort of uh, hash them um, in Git to allow people to check it out without problems. Um, but yeah, so, so there's loads and loads of these tests uh, being added. And in many cases, uh, you know, you saw the RTF improvements. Uh, Miklos is just a hero. Every time you, he fixes a bug, he'll, he'll check the document is correct, write test code for it. And then he'll do it so that you load the document, save the document, and load it again. Is it still there? Then we pass the unit test. So that, it's encouraging to see that. They're kind of hard to turn off every time you build. Pretty much everyone runs them. The Tinder boxes are running them. It, it really gives us a lot of confidence. Another thing, I don't know how many people have used Garrett. I mean, I think Garrett's kind of cool. So Garrett basically is a way of turning a open ID account, you know, Gmail, whatever, into uh, SSH, you know, sort of secure commit access uh, to the Git repository. So anyone can commit anything to LibreOffice that has an open ID account. And if you don't, and you're ideologically opposed to that, we have some people that are like that, I will set you up an account. It's not a problem. Um, however, um, so, uh, and, and it also goes to the mailing list. So we, we, we don't want web tooling to be the foundation of what we do. That would kind of suck, um, in my view, anyway. Um, so the, you know, all of this is posted to the mailing list so people can see it and review it there. And yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, though, because it means that all of that patch application via email and things not applying and rebasing and so on can be done remotely by other people. And we also have test build integration. So, um, Norbert's been working on this, and you know, we're going to have a big build cluster to do this. But, uh, so you submit the stuff, once someone's reviewed it, they'll say commit it, but only if it <coughs> compiles on all platforms. You know? and, and it just goes into a pipeline and eventually ends up rebased and, and, and shoved into master automatically. Which is, which is kind of really cool. So I encourage you to check out Garrett if you're running a free software project. 
Um, I'm sure it's bacon and broken and buggy in some ways, but it's really helped us uh, improve the speed of patch integration. Another thing that we uh, try and deal with, deal with is, is getting good feedback from people. So uh, I don't know if you've ever used Bugzilla. Um, it's not terribly user-friendly, I think it's safe to say. It is if you're a developer, maybe. Um, but if you're an end user, you know, the kind of person that's using LibreOffice, it's just impossibly confusing. So we have now a much uh, simpler JavaScript flow, actually initially written by Loic, um, that then allows you to click the icon of your you know, thing and select the type of uh, component. And we're extending this, uh, hopefully, to encourage people to do a uh, bisection and various other things that we, we've uh, done. So um, we can auto-tag regressions. If you can know, know the last version it worked in, so we can track regressions automatically, which is, which is kind of nice. And it looks, well, I don't know if it looks pretty, but uh, it, it looks a lot better than what you see on the a new bug page there. So if, if people want to reuse that, Rob is maintaining it and doing a great job. I, I'd recommend it to you. And when you go file submit feedback in LibreOffice, it takes you there and it should pre-populate uh, many of the fields. So other things, yeah, don't, don't build a huge ancient copy of Thunderbird as you compile. That's always a good tip. Um, so, <laughs> so now we just load the very, very simple uh, file that's used for your Thunderbird uh, address book. Um, yeah, so whilst adding all of these features, we managed to reduce our download size by about 20 megabytes, which is encouraging. Um, we, yeah, we've ported lots of legacy. So LibreOffice code predates STL. If you've used STL, it predates many C++ features. And uh, a lot of these we're you know, uh, improving by doing a standard way. So porting all of our legacy containers to STL, kind of nice. Lots of performance improvements, um, sort of all over the shop that, that help people you know, feel it's actually responsive. So that's cool. One of the major things in 4.0, and this is all stuff in 4.0, incidentally, that's shipping next, next week, hopefully. Um, one of the things is UI improvements. So previously, we've just really sucked with images. Uh, you know, whoever wrote the image interpolation thing was, you know, just sort of subsampling or something crazy. And so uh, now we're doing, you know, something relatively sensible in every case. And you can also reduce the size of your images, uh, you know, so you don't want... Whoever invented the, the thousand megapixel camera, you know, isn't it great? You know, you do, do one click and it blows your whole SD storage, you know, in a single shot. And, and then, you know, you, to, to fit it on the screen, you do all of this work to scale it down again. And, well, anyhow, you can, you can pre-scale it so that uh, you're not doing that work as you present. Which is kind of cool. Another nice thing that's happening is that the King, King Abdul Aziz City of Science and Technology, uh, as well as a whole load of people from the Indian Navy, um, are working on getting right to left really, uh, really right. So I don't know if you can see, you know, I need my mouse pointer uh, thing at this, this stage. You know, so this plus button was simply just not there in Arabic. Uh, you know, your only object, if you dragged it right, it moved left, and if you dragged it left, it moved right. You know, all, all of this, this good stuff, uh, proper Arabic numbering, the presenter console, similarly, all sorts of horrendous mouse mirroring things. So lots and lots of nice detailed work going in to make this uh, work in Arabic, uh, which, is, which is cool. Uh, new template selection stuff, uh, which is mm, prettier than it used to be. Uh, hopefully, it'll make. New templates? Uh, well, we are. We have new presentation templates. Um, my personal feeling is that most people want to theme colors instead of radically change the templates, and so to have one template per color sort of thing, you know, is, is kind of lame. So I think we'll be wanting to move to doing that theming, theming stuff for for templates. Um, we don't do that yet. On the other hand, previously we were duplicating the template per language, whether it was translated or not. So some of the 20 meg saving in download is, uh, is just that. Um, so there's some nice, uh, nice bits there. You know, when you have 100 languages, duplicating the template 100 times a bit sucks a bit. Um, styles, trying to make those easier to use. You know, we're constantly trying to stop people pressing the bold button. Um, we have some more uh, ideas about how to do that, but um, you know, that's, that's all encouraging. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so widget layout was, you know, I mean, I, you know, if you used Java back in 95, it was there. I'm sure Smalltalk did it, it everything. It did everything, right? So, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm always amazed at the, the number of older computer scientists that come and tell me it was all being done, you know, actually before computers were invented. But, but either way, <laughs> there, there, was a, there was a deliberate decision um, by the VCL uh, toolkit people to not do layout. I mean, they knew it was there. They knew it was good. But there's this immortal quote that human, human layout is always going to be better than, you know, computer layout. And maybe that's true, um, but people don't go around and redraw each dialogue for 107 languages, it turns out. So we were always getting, you know, characters chopped off, incredibly verbose dialogues that have all of this white space in. 
which you become sort of acclimatized to actually after a while, strangely. Um, but you know, the ever expanding dialogue for the ever longer translation is just not, not such a good thing. So Quaylorn at Red Hat's just done a, a fantastic job here. And we use the Glade file format now for editing these things. We still use VCL widgets. So inside it, there's, there's actually no GTK widgets being used, except I guess the, G, the top level windows are uh, just for platform integration. Um, but this is a long process. So far, we've got about 100 of these dialogues done. It's kind of easy, redrawing dialogues. If you want to get involved, it's a great place to start. I, I really encourage you. There's a lot more to do. So what else? Well, toolbars and menus and things, we're now integrating with, I guess, Unity, so pushing all of the menu and toolbar state up to the, the bar and to the funky, I forget, there's an awesome something or other that you can do something with. But anyway, all, all good stuff. Uh, and again, uh, funded by Canonical, lots of uh, good people doing things there. If instead you don't do that, you, you can have uh, personas. I don't know if you've seen this Firefox thing where you, you, know, you customize your UI to add a a funny picture of a bird in the top right. Um, but it turns out that actually you wouldn't believe a company wanted this, us to do this for them. So we did it for them. Um, OK, so those are all things that are in 4.0. How am I doing for time? How are we, uh, how are we coping? Yeah? 20 minutes. 13. Okay, I'll speed up. So um, here are some funky things that we're doing. Um, so uh, w first thing is Android. Uh, so how can we ship on the platforms of the future? Um, this is the trend for Windows, Google Trend. This is the trend for Android. You look at the trend for iPad, it's even worse, uh, an iPhone. So we've been at least looking into, in our spare cycles, doing something here. Here's a terrible first hack. Um, here's a slightly better uh, version. I, I might even have something up here I can show you, if you're lucky. Might even look a bit like that. So uh, here it is. Here's the, uh, the Android emulator in all its glory. And you know you can load your, your documents and you know, flip your pages. Obviously, uh, multi-touch on my laptop is not really quite what it could be. You can load you know, your Visio files and, and, and render them, and, and hopefully it all just works and so on. So the Android version is coming along. It's a bit big at the moment. So. Yeah, well, there's a 50 megabyte size limit on APKs in the Google Play Store. So at the moment, you have to uh, download and install that yourself. But all the code's there in Git. Uh, and there's some very interesting, interesting problems on Android around native code. So uh, yeah, if you want to do something fun, you know, some real heavy lifting, uh, there's some, some good things there. Let me see if I can make interactive collaboration work. I have uh, um, um, some interesting problems around this. And I think, but well, let's see, it, it, it might actually work. So I'm not going to do a whole uh, set up a telepathy session. It really uses telepathy. And in fact, I think I might have some slides uh, explain what's going on. Yeah, let me do that before I do the demo. So here's actually the, the, uh, uh, an accurate drawing architecturally of the LibreOffice core. And um, <laughs> if, if Jan Schmidt's talk on uh, rep wraps had been still there, you could have seen some of the original code that I refactored in the control programs. There was indeed a class called Model View Controller. You know? <laughs> so, he, he'd, he'd read the book, right? But uh, not really yeah, read the title anyway. One class. And indeed, it did everything. So um, uh, LibreOffice is, is, is not entirely like that. There are many different attempts to, to separate concerns, but uh, they, they don't really work. So how then can we turn that quickly into something that does collaboration? Um, so my thesis, and you know, I've been trying to persuade people of this, is that ordering is king. It doesn't actually matter what you do to the document, because humans are quite clever as long as you always do the same thing to everybody's document. And if you do this, then you can avoid all sorts of very clever composable operation things that do magic, but still run into the problem that when two people edit the same word, what do you do? There's still a conflict. Um, so yeah, so let the user deal with the, uh, the conflicts and just do everything very simply in the same order. So what does that look like? Well, I guess it looks like that. So essentially, when you type, nothing is applied to your spreadsheet. Actually, you completely sever the connection between your controller and your model. And you send those messages out to an instant messaging bus. And it turns out that if you use a Jabber chat room, one of the nice properties of that, which you would hope would be true, is that the messages go to everyone in the same order. You know, so the conversation looks kind of sane to everyone. And then simply, you reapply those messages in the order that they come in from the bus. So with a, a relatively reasonable, you know, a relatively small hack, you can get something that works relatively nicely. Of course, that means that your editing is applied asynchronously. You know, there may be a delay till you see something in the cell. Well, that doesn't need to block the client, uh, typically. Um, so yeah, you know, it sucks in many ways, but the implementation is feasible in linear time. So, uh, so there is a demo, thanks to these wonderful people from uh, various uh, different companies, and we'll see if the demo works. Almost certainly not, however. Um, yeah, so we did this thing. 
And I now have 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. So anyway, uh, so we can write, you know, uh, hello world here, and it appears there. Isn't that great? Actually, there's a very limited number of things that you can do here, you know, so I love X or, you know, something like this. Or um, I forget, actually, um, yeah, actually, there's very little else you can do with a, with a better demo. <laughs> If, if I had prepared this more carefully, you could see how entering numbers, you know, updates charts that you happen to have on both sides. But hopefully you see the general idea. I forget if we're uh, printing interesting things on the console. No, just that accessibility didn't work. Fair enough. That's quite normal. But hopefully you get the idea, and I don't have any time, so we'll pretend that worked. Okay. Excellent. Um, LibreOffice Online. Yeah, so there's a chance that this will work a bit better. So. Um, Instead of rewriting the whole thing in JavaScript, uh, we're just using the HTML5 canvas uh, and using web sockets and shoving compressed pings. So, you know, as you change stuff, well, you know, uh, the update is relatively small. Let me see if I have a browser here. I don't. Okay, so let me try running the thing. Excellent, even better. Uh -huh. And some people's demos are pre-canned. So here is um, LibreOffice. As you can see, you've got all this nice uh, Mark in the toolbar, that is apparently a feature. Um, and as I type this, you know, you can, you can do all sorts of uh, fun things. And you, so already I did something, wow, pagination, you know? So that's pretty extraordinary. What you see is what you get. You know, this is actually going to be on this page in this, you know, when you print this document out, which is something you can't predict. You know, use Google Docs, it doesn't do pagination, sorry. All of that stuff is shoved out the side. And one of the reasons is that the web APIs are just sufficiently lame that you can't do that. Um, and the other thing is, of course, they're not using the canvas, they're using CSS, great piles of it, uh, to do most of what they're doing. So, so this is kind of nice, and what I'll just do is I'll turn on uh, the re-rendering uh, support. Actually, first I'll draw a smiley face, because I think that's, uh, you know, that's important. Um, and then uh, as we're typing, uh, we can see what's going on. So you can see the re-rendering, but actually what's really re-rendered is only the last character that you typed. And that's, of course, compressed as a ping and sent over the wire. So people uh, say to me, this can't possibly scale. But then they also say you should rewrite 8 million lines of code into JavaScript. So, you know, don't believe everything you hear. Um, it can't possibly scale. So, uh, you know, here is uh, RemoteX, uh, LibreOffice running for, well, lots of slightly anonymous users are actually active. You know, they, they press the key or something, so they're using some, some CPU. But, uh, yeah, we're getting some pretty good, pretty good support on not massive uh, machinery in Largo, Florida, currently day-to-day, -day, every day. So if indeed rent of servers in the cloud are truly cheaper than buying a box and putting it on everyone's desk and then not using it using the box uh, in, the, in the server uh, farm, then, you know, then everything should be good. So getting involved, yeah, how can you get involved? My, my great hope is that someone here will think, cool, I could, I could get involved and make a difference there. So we have an easy hacks page, lots of small things to get through the process barrier. You know, so you can get a patch, you know will be accepted, it does something useful, but it's not terribly complicated, but you can get set up with Garrett, you can push it through and get it in. It's kind of cool. Um, there's an easy hacks page there, which is good. There's Garrett, as I, I mentioned previously. If you're into QA, we have a cool thing called Bye Bye Sect. So you can go to a bug that is a regression, and we have a, a Git repository of all of our binaries, all our binary releases. So you can check out binary releases and bisect them just by having this one repository. And so you can get down to about 20 commits of the actual bug without compiling anything and without being an expert you know, programmer of any kind. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Within, so you know, maybe it takes 10 seconds to start, test the bugs there, exit, and run git bisect again, and another second to check out the next version. And that's, that's pretty awesome. So just the, the, the brilliance of having someone say, you have a regression, it's in these 20 patches. It's just amazingly useful for development. So if you're not a developer, there are, there are great things uh, that we can do. Otherwise, just getting involved in testing you know, 0.0 releases, master builds, and so on. So how are my conclusions? We're growing. We're executing. We're finally, hopefully, starting to make LibreOffice something that you don't have to be ashamed of and sort of hide and uh, you know, uh, be embarrassed about. You know, that isn't a sort of a wart on the face of free software, um, but hopefully something that's you know, fun to be involved with, a genuine community that's actually really making progress. And yeah, and really improving. Still a long way to go. There really is, we're really just at the beginning. And there's lots of new work for contributors to do. You know, improving the UI, 4.0 will have an incrementally better UI. Uh, we, we'd love to have help there. So please do get involved. And yeah, finally, thank you for your support. I mean, there's so many people in the Linux ecosystem that have made LibreOffice possible, you know, from free desktop, 
uh, guys to, you know, all, all over the place. We have had uh, help and support and encouragement, and we're deeply grateful for that. So thank you for helping make freedom uh, something attractive. So that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. We have some time for some questions. I see a raised hand, so I'll just pass this over here. <laughs> um, the web version that you're showing, that, sure. is that using the Broadway backend of GTK? That is using the Broadway backend of GTK, yeah. Okay, is that 3 or 2? Or? So that's GTK 3. So we do have a GTK 3 backend. Yep. It's not as polished as you might imagine. Uh, you know, so embedding a video in there is going to cause some interesting problems. Um, so typically we ship GTK2, but we do have a GTK3 backend. You have to enable it. Uh, Did you do anything special to get the um, updates to show? Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's inside our code. We just draw a, uh, you oh, know, okay. a I press nine and it draws a red box. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Looking around, any hands? There's a hand. Very good. But it, it's a really good question because some of the drawing, you know, when we get the microphone, some of the drawing you see is just doing massive damaging for no no good reason. And so hacking these few things out made big differences. So. The, uh, the, the UNO stuff going on inside, has sure. that been refactored or is that as fun as it always has been? <laughs> so UNO was always promoted as the way to develop for open office. And I think it was just a profound mistake. Uh, like it's, UNO could do one thing well, and we're trying to move to making it as a scripting binding that works well. And I think it can do that. The problem is that it's being used to try and make a threading model something that doesn't really work. But it brings the sort of locking superstition in. So, you know, uh, it's going to be threaded, so why not add some locks, you know? Uh, create new locks, but with no lock hierarchy. You know, start, start taking them, releasing them everywhere, particularly whilst hold them whilst emitting events. You know, that's important. Anyway, so there's just lots of disasters around that, and we're, we're trying to remove those. And some of the UNO components we've sort of decomponentized, some of the extensions we've de-extensionized to make part of the core. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the tragedy is that UNO is actually more complicated than the things it wraps, typically. You know, it's actually harder to use, unless you're using a Python or, you know, a basic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just get stuck into the core. That's it's really easier. So, yeah. Sure. Hi. If I want to uh, contribute um, funds to getting bug fixed. Awesome. Sorry, this is not... <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I can't Good man, contribute yeah. the, uh, the legwork, but... Uh -huh. Um, what's your recommended process for doing that? Yeah, sure. So there's lots of ways we can do that. There are a number of individuals around the project that would be interested in one-on-one -on -one contracting. If you have a small budget, you know, so we have relatively cheap people and cheap locations. You know, the Slovenian uh, student who's, you know, graduated and wants something to do. Um, we have bigger professional consulting organizations like Lanido, um, Calabra, or uh, CodeThink, or, you know, these, these kind of people charge more, but, you know, potentially give you a quicker, better result. Um, and then there's, there's people like Sousa who, who are very hard to deal with, or Red Hat, Canonical, who you know, traditionally have a product-focused thing and then do a bit of NRE on the side, and we're just, it's just hard dealing with big companies. Um, so what I'd really like to encourage is for you to find people in this room who are, who are interested in, in fixing stuff in Australia and get someone in your time zone with the right skills. And there was someone here, actually, yesterday who worked hacks on FontForge and those things. So, that's what I, aha, yes, this man over here asking a question. So this guy's cool, you know, give him some money and he'll fix your butt. <laughs> that, that would be my, you know. So, so really, you know, part of my job in Sousa is going around and, and trying to give business to other people to build an ecosystem that is sustainable and will just grow and, you know, uh, and be exciting. And it's often easy to fix things that, oh, shoot, it's up. Sorry, I have one. Ah, go for it. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, trainers. Trainers. Okay, so another thing we're trying to do is we're trying to certify people. So we have a certification program so that actually when you hire a developer, you're reasonably confident they can fix something. Um, so we're certifying developers. We're trying to certify trainers as well, but they have uh, funny uh, concerns around ownership of training materials and stuff, and that's still going on. Um, you know, I think that's perfectly legitimate, um, but that, hasn't, that circle hasn't been squared so that you would know what... A, how do you certify trainers? Either way, they're, they're in a huddle trying to solve that problem. If you want to solve that problem with them, um, do, there was a guy behind you nodding about trainers. Maybe he is a trainer, you know? <laughs> I don't know, the, the Nike of the Libra office world. And um, so, yeah, so I, I don't have a good answer. I don't know people in Australia. Someone here probably will. I have a question. Oh, wow. Um, has, there, has there been much development in internationalization, translations, etc.? 
Sure. So I think we had 107 languages for 3.6. I think the number has gone up. Maybe it's 110. We're kind of at the upper limit of, you know, oh, we can always do more. Um, the Arabic is doing better. Yeah, Klingon, you know. Uh, one of the problems is there's really a lot of strings in LibreOffice. <laughs> it's, it's not short of them. Many of them unused, you know, so uh, yeah, it's just, it's just great, you know. Um, so we're trying to garbage collect some of those, but that, yeah, that creates interesting problems. Um, so, yeah, so translations are improving. I think uh, right and left support is probably a, a much bigger issue for, for a whole swathe of, uh, you know, Near Eastern um, languages. But yeah, uh, it's something. I mean, we use a Poodle server, so almost anyone can go and log in and start start helping out with that. Um, yeah, it should, it should be easy to get involved. Sorry, Norwich. Um. <laughs> with that, uh, you said that there was a method for debugging down to the uh, within a couple of patches. Yeah, yeah. That you didn't have to compile. That's correct. Does yep. that involve you downloading a copy from? of that binary, or yeah, is so that basically, done over the web? That's a great question. Basically, what you do is you download a Git repository, and depending on which one you choose, it could be about four gigs small. On the other hand, <laughs> for that to have several thousands of LibreOffice installs inside it, as I think a testament to Git's ability to pack stuff small, even if it's a weird binary files. So, yeah, yeah, so basically that gives you a live checkout. LibreOffice is one of the unusual applications that actually relocates. Check it out before you leave the uni. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can, you can, you know, uh, you can run it from anywhere, virtually, and, and all of the libraries find each other and it just works. So yeah, basically you run your git checkout, you know, and the git bisect command is just that. And you, you paste, you know, paste the output of, of git bisect and, and we can tell, you know, within 20 patches. And usually in those 20 commits, it's obvious which one is the one that affects that module, you know? So, and the, the, the tragedy is that even when you read the patch, it's not, not quite clear <laughs> how it can cause that a knock-on effect. So in some, in some cases, the coupling is so severe in the code that you know, just a slight change to holding a reference a bit longer than you ought to, and suddenly life cycle goes to pot and uh, something crashes. But we are working hard to improve these cases. Does that, does that help explain the bye bye sec thing? I mean, it's a very simple concept. I, I don't know. That, of other projects doing that, but probably there are. It's still a pretty big download. It is a, it's a pretty big download. There are smaller downloads depending on which, what range you want to test in. So if your regression is in a, in a smaller range, I imagine uh, we can do that. But if you want to get involved, you know, uh, making those smaller and so on, I'm sure Git could do an even better job because really the changes aren't that huge, um, often between commits. So, and yeah. one more question. Oh, oh from the height. Somebody who I know is a very heavy LibreOffice user. Uh huh. Excellent. <laughs> uh, um, when will the, the Android apps come up for the LibreOffice? When will the Android? Will, will, the apps. Will the apps? Yeah, yeah. As in, when will it be in the Android App Store? No, so that we can read LibreOffice document with it. At the moment, you have to use uh, some other application to, to view it in your Android phone or something. Yeah, yeah. So the question I heard was, when will the Android app ship? And uh, like any kind of shipping day question, I, I don't know. Um, clearly, the phone, phone thing will be shipping with 4.0. So you'll be able to get your you know, remote control working um, pretty soon. But that's actually very, very thin, pure Java app. All the rendering is done on your laptop, which has, you know, like, all the acceleration and stuff you need to, to make uh, these things quickly. Um, so it's actually very, very dumb. You know, it's a very, very simple protocol. It ha happens to do something useful. The, you know, actually getting all of the rendering code done, I mean, the, the sadness is that the vast majority of the heavy lifting is done. You know, the viewer is there, you can demo it, it renders a whole load of files. It's now really about slimming down the code. And the problem is there's not really any good profiling tools there. So I happen to be writing one uh, with Mark Wheelart, a red hat, uh, which basically takes your debugging, your dwarf debugging information, and then tries to build a call grind tree dump of that. So in K cache grind, you can see which inlined methods are consuming all your space, or which you know pieces of code, often auto-generated, are making things too big. So, so there's some work to do that. Um, but if people have clever ideas, I mean, you know, games can download gigabytes of textures on Android, so we should be able to we should be able to do something. But it's basically the size. That's all. All right, I'm conscious of time, so we'll have to end it, here, end it there. Thank you very much, Michael Meeks. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you.